They hated me for that. They talk trash. They kick the hornet's nest. They try to start fights. I never stop. I'm seven days a week. I have a one-year-old and a six-year-old. I don't think I'm gonna see my daughter walk for the first time. It, and, and just being honest with you guys, it, it hurts. There are a million reasons like we talked about before not to open a video game store. Yep. So are you crazy? This is Mark, owner of Dynamo Collectibles. He opened this video game store in Fort Myers last year when everyone was telling him it was a terrible idea. But despite the decline of retail and collectible prices, an unstable economy, and the uncertain future of physical media, he's still managed to build one of the most successful video game stores in the area, and today, I wanna to find out how. Mark, thank you so much for having me, man. You know, we're very money positive on this channel, and uh, so in that spirit, how much money are you making? This year, between card and cash, quarter of a million dollars. Wow, and how much of that total is profit, would you say? About 75,000. So not only are you doing in this space really solid revenue, but also solid actual profit after everything. Absolutely. Really excited to get the store tour as we're starting mm -hmm. that off. Can you give me your origin story of flipping video games? Because it's one of the most fascinating ones I've ever heard. Thank you. Um, so let's go. Uh, basically during COVID, uh -huh. the beginning, needed a way to help sustain my family. As many of us did. And also collect video games. <laughs> um, so I have a really big social media following and I decided to monetize it. I made a post saying, I'm gonna buy video games. And I ended up getting like 10, 20 messages. It was crazy. So I bought everything. Just put all my money on the line, bought everything. Yeah, and was the, what platform was this on and what was the content about? Twitter, uh, and my content was about Magic the Gathering and how much I hated my serving job that I served for 20 years. Um, so it was kind of like a dual action sure. uh, type of account. Yeah. Um, and we got a lot of people in from different backgrounds. So that means a lot of people that play video games. During COVID, a lot of people need money. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were in that position where they needed to stretch every dollar that they had. Yeah. So that meant them selling to me and I collected all the stuff that I always wanted. And that means lots of cool games that I never had. Earthbound, Chrono Trigger, like just the coolest Super Nintendo games. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this is uh, the 3DS section, Vita section, some cool stuff, PS3, PS4, bangers. Yeah, pretty Wii, eclectic Wii mix in here. You've got Switch. Yeah, lots of lots of the uh, the really cool games. Uh, one of my favorites, Sunset Riders on the Genesis. I know, I'm just really proud, sorry. So what happened was I decided to sell all the excess games that I had. There were a lot uh -huh. of doubles, a lot of triples, a lot of Super Mario World. The stuff that you weren't collecting. Exactly. So I put it all on eBay without knowing how much game prices it spiked. I looked at my first eBay sale and I thought to myself, whoa, there's something to this. So I decided to make another post. Hey, I'm buying video games. 10 messages, 15 messages, 20 messages. I ended up getting probably around 40 messages in my first week of doing it. Sourcing on Twitter. On Twitter. By the way. This is just Twitter. This I've is not never, Facebook. Yeah. This is not Instagram. This is not locally. This is strictly Twitter. All those spikes in games made me realize, yeah, there's something to this. So I bought more and more and more until my house looked like a hoarder's nightmare. And my wife got to the point where she was like, Mark, you gotta do something about this. My living room was filled with games. My garage was filled with games. My office was filled with games. She was going absolutely ballistic. There were a lot of lonely nights on the couch because she was just like, if you don't get this stuff cleared out, I'm gonna go crazy. The home business was taking over. It was absolutely insane. It was seven days a week, 70 hour work weeks, listing, taking pictures, shipping. This is my N64 section. Which by the way, very commendable N64 Thank you. here. I see very few game stores that have half this many N64 This games. is one of my babies. Um, I have curious. a couple babies in here. Yeah, before we get too far into the store, mm -hmm. like, how do you stay stocked with these? I buy for more and I sell for less. It sounds like a terrible business model, uh -huh. but I operate on velocity over margins. I think if you're willing to buy a game for 30 bucks and sell it for 45, mm -hmm you're going to make more money in the long run than if you buy that game for $20 and try to wait eight months to sell it for 50 or $60. Oh my gosh. It's just marking things up way I too much. I love that. One thing we always say on this channel is buy low, sell fast. So I want, we'll get deeper into that Definitely. Later. But sorry, I interrupted your story. You're, We're both terrible. <laughs> you're, you're in heavy home business mode. Heavy it's home business mode. It's becoming too much. It's becoming way too much. So we, next logical step, flea market. Why the heck not? So we go to the flea market. We start bringing all of my inventory, which my wife loved, and we start selling. All of a sudden, we're doing like three, four, five thousand dollar weekends on a, just a flea market. Two little booths. Oh my gosh! It was insane. So we started doing killer, killer business at the yeah. flea market. I start to think to myself, maybe it's time to start a store. Wow! And that's how it happened. How um, long ago now have you had a store? 
It's been about a year and six months. Okay. Um, and it's it's grown from a tiny, nothing on the walls, maybe five racks, maybe two, I think it was like two showcases. We were just a baby. Uh huh. And it went from this tiny little passion project to a monster in about a year. Crazy. We'll definitely have to ask you what principles you implemented to grow so fast, mm -hmm. but it looks like we're getting into the Pokemon section of the store. Yes, this is actually something we started a year ago. We decided to pivot into Pokemon because I got like so many calls a week about, do you buy Pokemon? Do you sell Pokemon? And I always said no, I always said no, I always uh -huh. said no. Didn't want anything to do with it because it's a fickle market. That sure. was That's the tough part about it. But what's not fickle is sealed. And one day a guy just came in with a binder. Uh huh. I didn't know anything about it, but I decided, you know, what the heck. I looked, I saw like Charizards, the Blastoises from Bayset. Yeah. I knew those. So I made the guy an offer, and apparently it was better than the other place that he went to. So he sold it to me happily. Wow. We had no idea what we were doing. We were putting out $1, $2 cards in the only small case that we had. Okay. That whole case sold in the first week. Wow. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty crazy. Again, I said this before, this is a theme. We realized there was something there. Yeah. We started buying Pokemon cards, started posting about how we were buying Pokemon cards, started posting about how we were buying Pokemon sealed product, made some friends in the area, made some connections with some local Pokemon resellers, and we blossomed into this incredible place to go get Pokemon singles, to get packs, to get ETBs and ultra premium collections, all sorts of Pokemon products. Yeah, it seems like a big trend in your business has been trying things and then doubling mm -hmm. down on what works. Yes. I'm excited to get more into like kind of the tactical side. Let's finish up this tour Woo! and then I'll start pelting you with the business questions. I can't wait. Uh, this is the PS1 and PS2 section. Uh -huh. We put all the heaters in, these, in the cases. Yeah, I'm loving it. This is my proudest achievement that we have. And the worst part is, is it was like twice as filled before Christmas. Wow. Um, or maybe the best part, for me at least. The best no part. kidding, yeah, best um, part for the bank account. This is my GameCube uh, collection, um, and this isn't even all of it. I almost never, like, this is just so unprecedented for game stores, I just have to commend you because, like, a lot of, like, the game exchanges I'll go into mm -hmm. will have, like, loose sports games and, like, maybe one or two decent titles. Yeah. And you've got, looks like a hundred. It's pretty excessive. Um, this is about the only word I could use to describe it. Um, and this isn't even all of it. Wow. We have all the games that are 30 and under on our shelves. So there's about another all hundred like of those. Out, so exactly. everything on the floor kind of out and about, this is all 30 and under? 30 and under, yeah. Okay. So we put an emphasis on quality mm -hmm. as well as making sure that we're putting out games that people are going to want instead of putting out games like sport games. Yeah, it seems like this is the kind of store that even though it's smaller, it would be really fun to come like hunting because they're yes. just you're utilizing the space so well and you've exactly. got so much stock. Yeah, that's our, our big uh, philosophy here is that if we can make an experience for people where they can come in and find games that they're going to love, yeah. then we're really, really doing the right thing by our customers. So Mark, talk to me about now that you've owned a game store for, you said a year and a half or mm -hmm. so, this is a career that a lot of people really romanticize. Yes. What's the reality of owning a game store and how does that not match up with maybe what your expectations were or what other people's expectations were? It's not as fun as people act like it is. Um, you watch a lot of channels where people are like, this is my dream job, this mm -hmm. is what I've always wanted, this is the coolest thing you could possibly do, you're on video games 24 seven. If you're taking it seriously, it is not the most fun job, it's very rewarding it's very interesting, it's always changing, but I think a common misconception is, is this is like a secret clubhouse, you know? Mm. You, all your friends can come hang out at it. Everybody plays video games 24 seven. We're always having fun and smiling and laughing in here. Mm. It's not the truth. The truth is, is that if you're going to be successful at a business, you have to take it very, very seriously. And I know a lot of people that just don't. And their stores last for maybe a year or two, mm -hmm. the lease is up and they're gone. You have to treat it like the animal that it is, which is very, very delicate, but at the same time, one that requires a lot of attention. Mm. And if you don't do that, you're not gonna be successful. It's just not as fun as people make it out to be. Yeah, what is something that you would say you do better in this store than most people do in the field? Customer service, mm. by a wide margin. Okay. And that's not me being egotistical, I come from a hospitality background. I worked in restaurants for over 20 years. This is my server voice, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you guys ever need anything, let me know. And that was actually partly what your Twitter was about, you said. Yes. Is your serving background. So yes. how does that translate into your game store? 
Um, so I think that customer service is what is severely lacking in this business. I don't think that people take it seriously enough. I think that if you're going to have people come into your store, one of the, um, one of the things that we do in the restaurant business, and, and I was a trainer, I used to open up restaurants, one of the things that we do is we don't take orders, we create memories. Hmm. And I think that that's something that is severely lacking in this business and that I try to do different than other things. I'm friendly with the customers. I talk to them. Yeah. I recommend games to them if they're uh, looking at the systems that I'm familiar with. I try to create a nostalgic bubble for them to live in for the next 20 minutes while they're in my store so they can really get that throwback of like a Blockbuster or the game store that they used to visit like an EB, you know, in right. the early 2000s. I want them to have this experience that they're A, going to remember, but B, tell their friends about. Uh huh. You said something really interesting when we were speaking before this, that you don't sell games, you sell nostalgia. Yes. So what's the difference? Games you play, nostalgia you live, mm. you remember. You're 10 years old again, sitting on your bed. It's summer outside. It's beautiful. School's out. You don't have responsibility. Yeah. You don't have bills. Mom's making dinner. Everything is peaceful. And when you play those old games, when you play your Super Mario Worlds or your Super Punch Outs or your Sunset Riders, you're living what you used to feel. At this point, you have bought and sold on Twitter. Yes. At flea markets and now in a game store. Yes. Talk to me about like that transition and what the differences are. Like if there are people watching at home and are asking, what model should I get into? What would you say? Um, social media, I wouldn't recommend getting into. It's very niche. You have to have a big following to do it. Mm. Um, and you have to have a certain personality temperament to deal with it. You have to deal with a lot of negativity. You have to deal with a lot of people kind of making fun of what you're doing. It's like a Reddit that never stops. It's a 24 hour thread. So with social media, it's its own monster, and I do emphasize the word monster. Selling at the flea market, a little bit different because a lot of those booths that you go to at flea markets, they're selling at over eBay prices. They're selling at over price charting prices, which is where they get a lot of their prices from. Mm -hmm. They are not creating the flea market experience. People wanna go in there and find a deal. They want you to wheel and deal with them. They wanna find that you have a $25 game for 20 bucks and see if you'll sell for 18. Yeah. Sure, why not? Let's do it. Let's make some money together. Let's have a flea market experience. It sounds silly, but that's what you go to them for. You go there for the yard sale experience. So that was sort of the feeling that we tried to create when people went to flea markets. Before we started rolling, you briefly talked about a little bit of flea market beef that you had before coming here. Oh, yeah. Is that something you can talk about? Sure. The other flea market stores hated me. I price things not to undercut them, but just because I thought that's what the prices were for games. Yeah. I didn't go to their stores and say, oh, they're selling Super Mario World for 30, I should sell it for 27, ha ha ha, I'm so evil. I just went and looked and saw what they were going for, and I took a few bucks off, because I figured that would give the person coming to your booth something fun to find. Yeah. It's not the typical eBay price game or over eBay price game. You're really getting a good deal when you shop at me at a flea market. Mm -hmm. They hated me for that. They talk trash, they kick the hornet's nest, they try to start fights. And this isn't hyperbole, folks. I'm talking about people that would literally come up to my booth and l just make fun of what I was selling things for because they viewed me as competition, but unfair competition because I was giving people prices that were real yeah. and not made up or not $30 over the typical price of the game. So how did that ever get resolved? No, I moved away. <laughs> I started a store. I always had that, that end game in the back of my head that I'm not gonna be here forever, but you might. Mm. So you need to have these interactions with me because they make you feel better. But me, I don't need to worry about them because in a few months, I'm gonna be in my own place. Wow, So that That's was powerful. That was how you get over you rise, you know, John Cena, you rise above hate. And I think that that's really, really important when you're in that position where people genuinely don't like you for reasons they don't even understand. One of the most powerful axioms I've learned that's helped me, especially on my social media journey, as you were mentioning earlier, that can be kind of toxic, is nobody hates you who's ahead of you. I can't exactly. think of a single time that someone I look up to in business who's doing things that I want to do has discouraged me along my path of trying to get better. They're almost exactly. always in your corner. 
the people who hate are the ones who are envious, right, and insecure. Yeah, it's it's funny enough. It's like that saying, like they hate us because they ain't us. <laughs> um, you get a lot of people that say, like, oh, you're making the hobby too difficult to get into. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're taking all the deals. Oh, you're taking all the games. When the truth is, people like us, we're not going to yard sales. We're not going to community sales. We're not going to flea markets. Mm -hmm. We're leaving those for you. Go have fun. Go to a garage sale. Find your five dollar Earthbound. Be as happy as a clam. <laughs> I don't care. I cheer for these people. Yeah. When they have successes and they post on Facebook, look, I had a guy last night. I found a copy of Alien Resurrection on the PS1 for thirty-three dollars. Boom. Right. Go get him, Tiger. All right, so folks, an absolutely mouth-watering handheld selection here at Dynamo Collectibles. Uh, before we get to this, because I think I am going to have the chance to get to buy a few of these, I wanted to ask you, like, there are a million reasons, like we talked about before, not to open a video game store. Yep. So, are you crazy? Oh, I'm like, nuts. <laughs> why, why did you decide to do this? Oh, I'm bananas. Um, a lot of it is just passion. Um, I wanted to continue doing customer service because... It sounds silly, but like I genuinely feel like everybody's here for like kind of like a reason, mm. and I feel like that's kind of like my reason. Um, wow! Is I just really really enjoy it. I like helping people and having fun with people. Yeah. Um. So yes, I am crazy. It is a very very difficult business to a get acclimated to, but b be successful at. Yeah. So it is not for the faint of heart. Um. So yes, crazy would be a great way to describe me. So for people watching, if they're thinking, maybe I want to get into a game store. How, first of all, do they know whether it's right for them? And what are the biggest concerns? What are the biggest uh, things to watch out for? The biggest pitfalls that people might experience? The Probably the biggest pitfall that people might experience is not starting with enough money. Um, mm -hmm. It is very expensive to start uh, this business. Um, and I'll be just transparent with you guys. I started with about $25,000 and it was a horrible mistake. Wow. Um, I thought, you know, phew, easiest day of my life. You know, I could buy this, I could buy this, I could buy this. I'll have money left over for inventory. You mm -hmm. don't. Um, to get everything set up, to get a tracks, showcases, slat wall, everything. You're talking thousands of dollars. So a big pitfall that I see and I fell into is that if you're not going into this with a good bit of money, yeah. you're going to fail right off the bat. Wow. So talk to me about some of the most expensive parts of the building. Um, the slat wall actually costs a ton per eight feet. Um, and you have to get about 16 feet, for me at least, per wall. So yeah. we had to get three walls worth of 16 feet of slat wall. Showcases can range anywhere from about 400 to $800. And I'm not embarrassed to say it, when we first opened, I was using Facebook Marketplace to mm -hmm. buy showcases. Oh yeah. So I had like a hodgepodge. I had like a mishmash of, of showcases because I I didn't have the money right to, to purchase all matching beautiful showcases. That's such a wild departure from the world that I'm used to, the biggest luxury that resellers mm. have, online resellers, especially if you're sourcing at yard sales and thrift stores to start out, is like you don't there really aren't startup costs. Right. Like what is there? Like shipping supplies and yep. like maybe a label printer if you want to get fancy, but you don't need it. You can buy, like I started my resale business with 500 bucks. Yep. You started with 25K for this and we're, things were still tight. Very tight. Um, and that is definitely a pitfall. All of the setup that you're doing, that's gonna drain your bank account. TV monitors, computers, points of sale, it all adds up. Talk to me about some of the other objections that people might have, like is retail dying? Are collectibles prices going down? Interest rates are up, the economy's unstable. Do those factor into your mind at all? No, um, as silly as it sounds, this is almost a recession-proof business. Hmm. When the economy is down, people want escapism. Yeah. They want ways to not have to feel bad about themselves. They mm -hmm. wanna get lost in a video game for 12 to 14 hours. That is what they're paying for, whether they're charging it. And I know this sounds terrible, like I'm like egging people on to spend money when the economy's down. But the truth is, is that's what they do. It is how it is. We had a hurricane decimate our area and I opened with no power and it was one of my busiest weeks ever. I did a 25% off sale on handhelds that were all charged. I sold out all of my handhelds yeah. because people just want that escapism. When the economy's up, people want entertainment. So one of the biggest things that we really see eye to eye on is pricing strategy. Yep. This is a big differentiator between you and a lot of other businesses mm -hmm. out there. Talk to me about one, what is this thing up on the monitor mm -hmm. and how does that relate to your overall business philosophy? So this is a hot list of systems that we are 
not so much in need of, but that we want to have a really high stock of because mm -hmm. they sell super duper well. So some things like AAA GameCube titles, Pokemon games, random systems, handhelds, all of that we want to have in store because it sells really, really well. Yeah. So one of our philosophies is with systems, especially the newer ones, beat GameStop. Make sure you are defeating them in their trade. Make sure you are defeating them in their um, buy cost. Make sure you're defeating them for their pro because for 15 or whatever it is, $20, nowadays, you can become a pro member and you can get a pretty nice chunk more for trade-in or for buying. So our goal is to buy for more than they do. Yeah. That's step one. If they can come to you and sell like an OLED Switch for $140 or get 175 credit, well, GameStop is buying OLED Switches for $88. Wow. Now we're buying it for $12 more. Might not sound like a lot, but it is, especially when you're getting that much more credit as well. That is philosophy number one. Yeah. Beat your competitors like GameStop. You don't want to, you know, browbeat your opponents that are in the same business as you, but you want to beat the juggernaut. That's the big one. Totally. You also want to stock very, very popular games. Mm -hmm. Pokemon, as you know, is a blue chip stock. It goes infinitely fast. The prices are always the same or they go up. They never ever really go down. Yeah. I, I saw a small decline in Pokemon games after the end of COVID, but that's it. So we wanna make sure that we're stocking all sorts of things. Nintendo handhelds, for example, those super fast movers. They are just absolute beasts. You can't sell enough handhelds. You can't stock enough handhelds. So this is the list of games that you want people to know when they come into the store, we pay really well for these. Yes and you're willing to do that and take a tighter margin exactly. just to have the stuff in store. Exactly, I mean, I don't know anyone that's gonna be buying a Sony PlayStation 2 for 65 bucks or giving 80% trade credit on it. Yeah. I don't know anybody that does that. We price them really aggressively as well. Our margins on them are a lot slimmer because we wanna operate on that velocity and liquidity. Mm -hmm. We wanna make sure that that 60 bucks that we spend that PlayStation 2 sells immediately. Now that 60 bucks is freed up again, and there's profit margin that we can mm -hmm. sink into other things. So for someone who would say, wait a second, why would you sell a PS2 for 80 when you could just wait a little bit longer and probably sell it for 100? I just think that the philosophy on it needs to be more consumer friendly. A lot of stores fail because Selling games and owning games becomes like a personality to them. Mm. It becomes something that they are attached to. So they'll sell that copy of Earthbound for $500. We know it's like a $270 to $300 game, but they're gonna sell it for a huge amount of money because they think it's cool. They think it's eye candy. They think it's fetching. People wanna come in and see it. Mm -hmm. I don't have that same philosophy. I'm not attached to anything in the store. I love certain games in the store, but if my favorite game walked through the door, I would sell it. Yeah. I wouldn't be like, well, Jake Yacoon 2, great game, you should buy it. Um, market tip, one of my favorite games of all time. I have posters of Jake Cocoon and Jake Cocoon 2 in this place. But if it walked through the door, I'd be the first person to be like, oh, you like PlayStation RPGs? Boom, this is one of the goats. This yeah. is one of the best, most fun ones. Because I want to share that experience with other people. I don't want to just hoard it. One other thing that you do that is just weird, that we talked about before mm -hmm. is paying way up on certain individual games. Yes. Maybe even at or above slightly market rate. What the heck is up with that? So one of the luxuries you do get is you do get that little bit of markup uh, because you're a store and you're providing people with all sorts of really, really good items. Um, so what I'll do is like a po copy of Pokemon Emerald is gonna walk through the door. Dry battery, mm -hmm. I would buy it for 160. I'm gonna sell it for maybe 200 to 210 okay, after replacing yeah. that battery. Right. But Doing so means that that customer is gonna tell their friends, hey, this guy buys games for a lot. If you're buying things at very, very competitive prices, you're doing right by the customer, you're getting word of mouth, you're getting goodwill towards that customer for when they wanna get rid of more stuff, and it's just cyclical. It's a circle of life. It's do things correctly, get those items, sell those items, do things correctly. It just, it's a never ending circle where you can keep making tons of money, but at the same time, you can give the customer a fair deal. You mentioned Mario Kart Wii as a mm -hmm. specific one that you just tend to pay crazy for. Yeah, I, I will pay $25 on a copy of Mario Kart Wii. I have no qualms doing that. Even though you're selling it for what, 30, 35? 30, 35, usually 35, um, because it's a very, very fast mover. So yeah, is it like a 29 to $32 game? Sure, but my margin doesn't need to be huge on it because once I sell it, I'll have 10 people come in and say like, oh, I've got Mario Kart Wii's. Wow. And all of a sudden, all those Mario Kart Wii's hit the shelves and they all sell. Well, and you could totally get away with paying 
10, 15, 20 oh, yeah. for Mario Kart Wii. Easy. Nobody would complain. No. That's what everyone does. Absolutely. It reminds me a lot of a principle that they use in retail a lot mm -hmm. called loss leaders, mm -hmm. right? They'll put one product on an end cap, right? That people buy all the time, eggs, milk, diapers, mm -hmm. toilet paper, and say, advertising all the catalogs, all the commercials, we've got this for five bucks and it's normally 15. And mm -hmm. they'll actually lose money on that product yep. because they know when people come in the store, they're not just going to get the toilet paper. Exactly. They're gonna get a cart full of other stuff and the exactly. profit on those other items is gonna more than make up for it. Get them in the door. Folks, this, this is what I'm on about. It's long term, it's not nickel and dime on every little deal. It's not, uh, make $5 here. Oh, I'm gonna hold on to this until I sell it for $20 more. It's do right by people, pay your partners, get people in the door, make them feel welcome, make them feel good exactly like you're doing. It's very, very important to make sure that the customer is happy. I cannot emphasize this enough. Yeah. So to all your commenters and readers and watchers, that is where the industry is lacking and don't ever stop pushing for you deserving better. So Mark, another thing that we share in common is we're both optimizers. Mm -hmm. We love taking our business to the next level. Definitely. What is some way, what are some ways that you plan on doing that with this business for the next year? We're gonna get more heavy into marketing. Okay. Um, we're going to put more effort into um, getting ourselves out there, whether or not it be through Facebook Marketplace, uh, through Google Analytics, um, we're going to try to become a more popular store in the area. We're focusing on trade nights too. Um, we're doing video game trade nights and Pokemon card trade nights. Oh, that's cool. So we're inviting local resellers to come in here. You can buy from each other. You can sell to each other. It doesn't, you don't have to sell to me. I'm not going to get mad if you're like, oh, you're selling that game that I have in store. No, we want to build a community around it. I offer increased trade credit those nights. So those people that bring in those games that don't sell at the end of the night, they're just like, Wow. Here you go. Which that's very <clears throat> countercultural on its own. Yeah. Inviting in your competition to your space to oh, yeah. make money in the place that you're oh, paying yeah. rent. Definitely. It's crazy. We do that specifically because we want to cultivate a community. We want to build something around the store. Mm. And in those moments, those people come back and they, you know, they scan everything in store because now they're trying to make money. But we're building those people. We're bringing them through the door. We're saying, hey, our prices are great. Our trading in is great. Come in, hang out with this guy, buy games off of him, sell games to him. I don't care. It's just, I think it's very important to build something around your store that's going to make people go, oh, I need to be there. I need to be there that Friday night because there's free pizza. Yeah. Like I need to be there so I can see everything that everyone is bringing. And we've had some pretty good success with it. We've had nights where like 20, 30 people showed up and they set up little tables and they just did like a little trade event. And it was really cool. I love how reckless that business model seems on the surface. Do you like, does your store see an increase at all in sales in those days? Is it oh, yeah. net negative, positive? No, it's awesome. Like I'll do the trade night starting at like five o'clock. People will be showing up at three setting up and they'll wander around the store for two hours and they'll buy things and they'll look at my $5 wall and scan every game to see the seven or $8 games. Buy four, get two free. So, hey, we're making 15 bucks. Um, they'll come in early and they'll just love it. And they'll trade in all their stuff that they want to get rid of early um, and parlay that into stuff that they think they could sell at night. Yeah. And it's great for me because I'm getting in a ton of inventory. Uh, some of it not good, some of it really good. But Reckless was how we were looked at at first. And then it was more mad scientists afterwards. Yeah. Like you're doing something that nobody else is doing, but it's working. That's so cool, man. I love to hear about stuff like that. I purchased this store for 400 more square feet for a reason, because I want it to be filled with as much awesome stuff as possible. Totally. So I think those are the three big goals are marketing, creating a bigger and better community, and really stocking the shelves. Love the game plan, man, that's inspiring. Gotta have one. Mark, we've talked a lot about tactics, individual strategies, but let's get real for a second. Yep. Talk to me about like, what is necessary? What do you have to sacrifice to own a business like this? Because mm -hmm. It looks great, you know, when you're in the store and it's well stocked and people are coming in and customers are happy, but yep. like, what's required? Time. So much time. Mm. Um, I work 70 hour work weeks. I never stop. I'm seven days a week. Yep. I sometimes get a day off. I was telling you earlier, I've had Christmas off and that's my only day off in almost two months. Um, I had Thanksgiving off. I get major holidays off. That's really about it. I have some people that come in and they'll work a day for me sometimes, but that is very few and far between. 
So um, you you don't really have a ton of employees. It's like it's you in here. And that's where a lot of stores don't understand the sacrifices you make. I have a one-year-old and a six-year-old. I don't think I'm going to see my daughter walk for the first time. Mm -hmm. Genuinely. I, I don't believe I will. I'll see it on camera, but I won't see it in person. Wow. Because you have to be here so much. You have early days and you have late nights. If somebody calls you on your day off and says, I have to sell this collection today, I need money, I don't care if I'm off. I'll be right at the store. Wow. It never stops. Days off for me are maybe sleeping until 11. And then I go right to work on the computer. I start getting into Facebook groups. I start doing marketing for the store. Um, there is no stopping. It is nonstop. Um, I've missed plays for my six-year-old. Um, date nights for me and my wife are few and far between. And it might sound like I'm negligent, but I'm not. I'm trying to provide and secure a future for my family. Mm. And that is very important to me. The end game is uh, retire by 50. Wow. Um, and that is very important to me that I can spend that time with my family after that. But right now, it, and, and just being honest with you guys, it it hurts. If you don't mind me asking, like, how is your family responding? My wife is very supportive. Mm. Um, we've been together since we were 14, so about 23 years now. She was my uh, middle school sweetheart. Oh, my um, gosh. So we're, we're very, very lucky to be as in love as we are and to have her be as understanding as she is. My kids, you know, my one-year-old, she doesn't really know. When she sees daddy, she claps. She's excited. <laughs> my six-year-old, you could tell, is a little bit more affected by it. He, you know, when I get home and he goes to bed, daddy, will you sleep with me? You know, he wants that, that little bit of extra time with me. Mm -hmm. um, but my wife is very supportive, so I'm very blessed in that regard. But there are nights, you know, like when it was her birthday, I had to work on her birthday. I had a convention on her birthday. So when I got home, I was exhausted. We didn't even really get to hang out. I had to go to bed. You know, I got her a card, told her I loved her. And we're planning a date night really, really soon for that. But if you're not sacrificing, you're not doing it all the way. And it has to be done all the way. That's real. Thank you for sharing that, man. I, yeah. I think that's a place that a lot of people aren't necessarily willing to go. And I have found with the business owners I've talked to, supportive spouses are a huge common denominator. So they are. They guys are like you and I, we're really lucky. Anything else, like outside of <clears throat> the family, the time, does anything else come to mind for you when you think about sacrifices? Money. Um, you have to put the business first. Yeah. When I first opened, I didn't pay myself for the first four months. I had no money. I, wow. We were living off my wife's paychecks um, because you have to buy, you have to pay all your bills on time, you have to pay your taxes. Everything amounts to a ton of money. So for those first four months, I had nothing. It was it was peanut butter, jelly, and ramen. Because to start with that type of bankroll, but to know that it's all gonna be gone before you even get a chance to spend it, um, it just, it's really, really tough. You have to be very, very mentally strong to know that your money situation is going to suck for a while. It's not going to be good. And you know, you know, you started with 500 bucks. You probably spent 400 of those dollars and then sat there one day on your couch and went, I only have $100 left. Like, what am I gonna do? 74 was the lowest my bank account ever got. Exactly. I was like, all right, it's a Saturday. I have $74 to spend at this yard sale and then I just have to sell something yeah. or else I can't go next weekend. Exactly, and that's where I got, where I was so low in my bank account, I, you know, I cried, man. Like I, I genuinely just sat on my bed and I cried because I didn't know where the next meal was gonna come from. I didn't know where the next uh, tank of gas was gonna come from. And when the money started finally rolling in, we started doing really big sales. We started really hitting. It was the biggest relief you could possibly imagine. So um, in terms of sacrifice, be ready to be afraid all the time when you first start. Dude, one thing that I think about a lot is like our business has been doing really well recently with our like buy list program and Amazon's going good. It's Q4 as we're filming this. Yeah. The weird thing is like the better the business does, my anxiousness about it, your anxiety, my fear, it doesn't go down. No, it's it goes like up. You're more aware that like on this roller coaster ride of business, it's going to go down. And the higher you are, the more that's going to hurt. Success must be maintained in order to feel 
comfortable. Yeah. Like to not feel like everything is going to collapse all at once. So you have to make sure that everything that you're doing is to sustain the business and then grow the business. Worry about sustaining, then worry about growing. Then worry about sustaining, then worry about growing. Wow. Yeah, I, I often wonder like, when am I not gonna be scared anymore? Never. I'm five years in so far, it hasn't happened, but Never. I hope one day it does for you, we'll it, see. It probably won't, and I think that that keeps us on our toes, to be yeah. honest, I think that's what separates us from you know uh, weekend resellers, mm. is that that fear is always gonna be there. That fear of failure, that fear of, sometimes that fear of success, that once yeah. you get to a certain level, people's expectations of you continue to rise. Mm -hmm. And when you don't meet those expectations, they start to turn on you. So it, it comes down to an immense amount of fear, an immense amount of desire, and an immense amount of just being willing to sacrifice mm. in order to be successful. Wow. That's that real stuff, man. I appreciate you going there. We just, we, looks like we missed your first customer of the day. I'm sorry I think, about I that. think he came <laughs> in because he thought we were a karate studio still. So. <laughs> we need to get a shot of that sign. Yeah, I love definitely. that. Cool, well, I wanna buy some of these things from you. I have a few last tactical questions sure. for you so we can lighten it up a little bit. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, folks, we've got our handheld stack here. I'm gonna start going through these and just kind of inspecting and testing as I'm talking about this next one. Resellers, if you're watching, this is another point to get your notebook mm -hmm. and pen out because when I asked you advice that you have for other business owners, one of the things you said was source bravely. Yep. Source bravely. Can you explain that? What does that mean? Sourcing bravely means doing things other than going to garage sales, estate sales, flea markets. Um, it means, like you said before, opportunity is everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I found my niche on Twitter. I mean, it's, it's somewhere that nobody else was exploring. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that there aren't other spaces out there that people could, um, could look. Buying off other resellers is just an absolutely fantastic resource. It's a way to get out there and make contacts, make friends, make people in the industry or your local community want to work with you. Yeah. Don't be afraid to contact these people or to reach out to these people. If you see somebody posting on Facebook, hey, I'm buying video games, you know, reach out to them and say like, hey, I'm also buying video games. Yeah. You know, like let's network a little bit. Like Buy let's work lunch. together. Is there anything that you you are looking for specifically? Hey, I'm looking for Nintendo handhelds, but you're looking for Super Nintendo. Mm -hmm. If I find Super Nintendo, let me send to you. You send me the handhelds. Like let's start working together. Totally. Especially if you're the kind of person who is feeling disheartened with how much competition there is and I can never find stuff at thrifts or by the time I go to yard sales, people are already walking out with boxes of yeah. stuff. Maybe try to not scorn those people and instead go shake their hand. This is how things start to spiral, not in a bad way, but they snowball into a really big thing that people can start stores based off of. You might, make, you might meet a partner when you're doing this. Let's go out there and let's make these connections. Let's be friends with our fellow resellers. Let's not view them as competition. Let's go out of our way to, like you said, buy them lunch, work with them on what you need and what they need. And you might make a best friend that you can start a business with. I have to just jump in and reiterate how right on this is, this exact words they just said here in this conversation, because I myself was always at swap meets. I still am with my friends and I would see certain competition. There was certain competition within the group that I'd start talking to them and see the same people out there and I started to become friends with them. And just like they said, one of those people ended up being Chris, who is now is our, on our podcast and also now, yes, an actual partner in owning the SoCal Gaming Expo. So yeah, any of this stuff can be completely, completely put into your work practice. These guys are right on. Right. So it's, it's definitely, sourcing bravely just means going out of your comfort zone. You're not alone. You don't need to be a lone wolf. I love that. Tell me this, for people who are watching and are thinking about maybe dipping their toes into this business on the retail side, is this a business that you honestly recommend in 2024? Nope. Um, <laughs> like I was saying, you have to dedicate massive amounts of time to it. Uh -huh. And you need the wherewithal to have that dedication. Yeah. Not a lot of people are built for this. Not a lot of people are very friendly or personable. They might be incredible on the analytical side of things. They might mm -hmm. be great at sourcing. They might be great at buying. They might be great at selling on um, 
eBay or Amazon. But at the end of the day, they might not be very good when it comes to that customer service. So talk to me about like with video games in general, maybe not necessarily on the store side, a lot of people would say, hey, physical media is dying. Like don't get into this business. It's not worth it. You're gonna be out of business in 10 years. Would you agree with that? No. Um, physical media is going to be around a lot longer, especially with certain companies saying that they're going strictly to digital. Mm. People want to hold games. They want to put cartridges in. They want to put discs in. They want to make sure that they're reliving that experience that they had when they were younger. So if they're not going in there and enjoying the game, if they're not displaying it, or they're not putting it on a shelf, or they're not putting it on a rack, they're going to be a little bit more disappointed. It's more like playing a movie than playing a game at that point. Yeah. So I think that the death of physical media is heavily, heavily, heavily overstated. Mm -hmm. I think that you're gonna see more physical media get sold. As soon as that those companies go to digital only, you're gonna see a outburst, a huge upswelling of physical media. Wow. Do you think there will be long-term implications like the kids who are growing up today with primarily digital and mm -hmm. downloads and getting games on Amazon? Like, will we eventually see a decline? I think that those kids are a lot more savvy than we give them credit for. Mm. I believe that they want those old games. I have a lot of 16, 17, 12 year olds coming in here. I want Super Nintendo games. I want 64 games. My dad told me that GoldenEye was the best shooter of all time. I got to play that and I got to buy a 64 he to do wrong, that. first of all. <laughs> they want those things that their parents grew up on. It's yeah. like, you know how kids get into rock music. Their parents got them into Leonard Skinner and Kansas and those mm -hmm. bands. Now all of a sudden, they love Leonard Skinner in Kansas. It's the same thing with video games. Their parents are gonna get them into 64 games. They're gonna break out that box of old Super Nintendo and that kid's gonna fall in love with the sprites and the music mm -hmm. and they're gonna want that for themselves too. I think that it's nothing to be afraid of. I think that it might be a little bit, uh, it might be just a little bit of fear of the unknown but that unknown to people that aren't afraid of that future, it's very bright for us. One thing that I always say is like, I'm not in the speculation business, I'm in the adaptation business. Exactly. Right, our jobs are not to predict what's going to happen, and so as long as the market's currently good, I pretty much recommend it to people. Yeah. Everyone eats, and uh, I've never really benefited from trying to predict what's going to happen five, 10 years down the line. Yeah, I mean, adaptation is like, the is easily the most important thing. Like I was mentioning earlier, I didn't have any type of love for Pokemon, but it started to show me that it was very, very profitable. I adapted into Pokemon. Same with other um, other hobbies and other uh, things that we offer. Lorcana is starting to get big. Yeah. We start to offer Lorcana now. We're adapting to what the market is dictating. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a very, very powerful trait to have that you can easily segue into what is now considered popular yeah. and aggressively go after it. But that's another reason that it's really hard to start this business in 2024. You have to be aggressive. You have to be able to adapt very quickly. And if you're not, you're gonna get left behind and you're gonna be one of those stores that closes in here. Absolutely. So you talked about earlier, retirement at 50 yeah. is a big goal for you. Beyond that, like, what's your end game with all this? Basically, I want to spend the next 13 years giving people the best experience they can get. Mm. I want to, which is aging me, by the way, I'm 37. Oh, okay. Something that means a lot to me is putting it out there for people to have the best time they possibly can. Mm. The end goal after that is to literally sell this business, live off some of the money and invest the rest. That's it. I just want to create a comfortable life for my children, my wife, and I want to live my life I feel like working 70 hours a week since I was in my 20s, I've earned it. Folks, if you are in the Fort Myers area, definitely check out Dynamo Collectibles. And if you wanna see a video of a $5 million Pokemon card business owner who operates in his basement, I will link it right down here. And we will catch you guys on the flip. On the flip.